further ado, I introduce Julie Leon. Leon? Lion. Lion. Oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm thinking of the French city. Yes. <laughs> Julie Lyon used to interview kids as a reporter, and now she writes books for them. Her debut nonfiction picture book is, in, is titled A Dinosaur Named Ruth. Before writing books, uh, Lyon wrote for daily newspapers in Oregon and Utah for more than 10 years. A graduate of the Columbia, which is I'm also an alumni of Columbia. Oh, nice. In physics, though, uh, journalism school. She loves to dig up remnants of the past and get inspired for her next book. In her free time, Lion likes to swim and play the ukulele. Are you going to serenade us? <laughs> do you know, I sometimes do that at school. <laughs> I couldn't bring my ukulele on the plane, however. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much to the South Dakota Humanities Festival for bringing me back. I got to be on the east side of the state last year in Brookings and Sioux Falls, and it was fantastic. Um, that was actually the first time I'd come back to South Dakota since 2018 when I researched this book. Um, and today I'm going to give you a, a talk that I often give to kids, but I've also given it to teachers um, and librarians, a little bit about how I why I wrote this book, how I discovered this book, and um, how I'm also hoping to leave you with a message about why nonfiction is important. Um, so the story behind the story of a dinosaur named Ruth. Um, kids always want to say, why did you write this book? And why this book? You don't even live in South Dakota. And they're right. Um, is it okay if we're in the dark? Does that still work for you? Okay, okay. Um, so, like Peggy explained to you, I was a newspaper reporter for 11 years, and I, I loved that job, but when I had a couple of kids, I actually now have three kids, um, it made more sense for me to stay home and take care of those kids and, and earn money as a freelance writer. Um, and, and while I was spending all that time with them, I kept thinking about books because of course what do parents do we all read with our kids right and I kept thinking gosh I know what I should write about this incredibly handsome dog right my dog named Sydney and um, he had amazing um, true life adventures which I would like to make into books one day um, uh, but I he also inspired me and I had thought of all these made-up stories I wanted to write um, and and as I was thinking about that and thinking about that, my oldest was getting to be maybe kindergarten age and we had dipped into the nonfiction section, the true story section. And I noticed these were the books that really made an impact on my kid. He would turn to me and say, mama, is this a true story? And he was thrilled when it was. And I thought, okay, I was a journalist. I love researching. He likes true stories. I like true stories. I should try to figure out a way to write some true stories myself. And Utah, as you may know, is rich in children's book authors. So I started taking some classes and I learned that biographies were something at the time that were very popular um, for people to be writing. And I thought, okay, I should try to write a biography. Um, and, but I wasn't sure what to write about. There are a lot of people on the planet, right? Um, and I didn't want to necessarily write about someone that someone had written about before because being the journalist that I am, we love to be the first at things. We love to discover what I now know is called hidden history. So I was thinking and thinking and wondering what I should write about. Um, when, I'm walking, when I'm working with the kids, we learn the word nonfiction. So you guys already know that word. I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, so I was driving around Salt Lake City and I was thinking and thinking and thinking about what I should write about and I'm literally in a minivan with my kids and we drive by something and I have that light bulb moment. Are you ready for it? What did I see? I saw my dinosaur. I saw my sink and no Sinclair is not sponsoring this in any way. Um, they don't know that I run around with a Sinclair dinosaur. Um, but I was like, that's it people who discovered dinosaurs because I had noticed that of course there's lots of dinosaur books in our libraries and at our schools and maybe in our homes but I didn't see a ton of books at the time about people who found dinosaur um, dinosaur bones and not only that I wanted to write about a woman finding a dinosaur bones because I thought you know I have seen a few books and they've been typically about men um, and often typically frankly about someone who deserves many books Mary Anning you, a lot of you probably know who that is um, a woman in England who about a hundred and 50 years ago, 200 years ago, was discovering all these 
dinosaur related things and is a very important person when you look at the history of um, dinosaur discovery but she doesn't live in the United States. And I really thought, where are the American women discovering dinosaur bones? They have to be out there. They deserve, there's someone out there who deserves a book written about them. And I did the thing we all do, I got on Google. <laughs> and when I got on Google, there still aren't that many things that come up, I, I found this name, Ruth Mason. And I thought, um, oh wait, I also do this with the kids. Uh, we talk about what a paleontologist is and we do have a vote and there's only one right answer to this vote that of course a girl could be a paleontologist. Um, but so I found out this name, Ruth Mason, and for about a day, I think I thought she was a paleontologist because of some things that I read on the internet because as we all know, not everything on the internet is correct. Um, and I started learning about her and I thought, this is even better. She was not a paleontologist. She was just a, an ordinary kid who didn't grow up to study dinosaurs, didn't have a collection of dinosaur books, didn't have a museum near her house because she was a very intelligent and self-educated person, learned about her land and began to notice some unusual things on it. So being the reporter that I am, I had this name, I had some information. I started, e I was emailing people in Wales because I knew that there were dinosaur bones from South Dakota in Wales. That was very fun. I was getting emails back in Welsh and English, two languages. Um, and I started calling people in South Dakota. And one of the first people I called was, if you've read the book, um, a man named Rick Brooks, who I was thrilled to meet again when I came out here a few days ago, a wonderful um, fossil hunter, who, if you read the book, is the person who knocked on Ruth, Ruth's door. Um, but when I called Rick from Salt Lake City on a cold winter day, and I was sort of feeling defeated and thinking, gosh, I can't write a book. You know, this is a, what do I, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. But I picked up the phone and I called Rick and he, it was as if he'd been waiting for years for me to call. And he was just thrilled to talk to me about this woman named Ruth Mason, who he had first met in 1979. So remember this is 20, 39 years later. I am I, a person he's never met, calls him on the phone and, and we're talking and he starts telling me about Ruth and he said, the best thing I ever did for her was see her dreams, help have her dreams come true. And I just had this feeling in my gut that you sometimes have when you're working on a newspaper story and you just know, you just know, you have to keep going. You have to find out what happened to this man, to this woman, to know that her dreams came true. And all I've got is the snippet of a story. I knew I had to, what did I have to do? go to South Dakota. <laughs> and so my mother-in-law came, she stayed with my kids who at the time were, I was thinking about this the other day, I think they were three, five, and seven years old. I feel bad now that I think about it, that she had to stay with them for the weekend um, you know, to help my husband. And I came out here and I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had driven through South Dakota, maybe in my 20s. I helped my brother move across the country. We had seen Mount Rushmore. And that was it. <laughs> and we kept going. Um, so I was just on my own in Rapid City, had no idea how far apart things were, um, but everyone was so kind. And I met the famous Rick Brooks and um, we chatted about Ruth. He shared some photos with me, which I'm gonna show to you guys in a second. Um, and this is me um, near his Ammonite collection in his house, because when he met Ruth that day, when he knocked on her door, what he was looking for was Ammonite fossils. Um, and uh, she didn't really have, as I say in the book, what he wanted, um, but she said, oh, I got these bones in my yard. I mean, you can come, or she didn't even know they were, she, I got this collection in my yard. Um, and when they walked out into the yard, he had his light bulb moment with her when he said, yes, what you have here is something special. He himself, now he's like, I wasn't quite totally sure what it was, but he knew they were very old fossils and that he wanted to find a way to help her. 
Um, so here I am in South Dakota, and I am, it, that's actually on Ruth's property, and her grandniece now lives there, a woman named Janine, who's been very kind to me, and walked me around and showed me some of the cliffs where there would have been fossil bones weathering out, falling down to the ground. And for some of you who've been in areas like this, this all makes sense, but when I'm talking to kids, who have lived a much more urban or suburban life, they just can't even understand. And I don't think I could really understand until I was walking around with Janine and she was picking up pieces of dinosaur bone. And here's something here and here's something here. And she has, you know, a piece of ankylosaurus in her house and a part of a T-Rex, you know, it just, just in her living room because that stuff is all over her land. And of course now, because we know these are dinosaur bones, but what I often do with kids is I say, Okay, imagine, and this is so hard for kids, but what if you've never seen a book about dinosaurs and you've never been to a dinosaur museum? And, and this is what always gets the kids. They were just discovering a T-Rex when, when, when Ruth was about seven years old, it never been displayed in New York, never been put together. So every kid, if you, most kids, if you ask them, their favorite dinosaur is a T-Rex, right? But what if a kid doesn't even know what that is? So you can just imagine how Ruth was bringing this stuff home and her parents were working hard. She was the oldest of eight children. They, I have three children, that keeps me extremely busy. I cannot even imagine having eight and working the land and ranching and they raise sheep and they, they raise horses for the cavalry for um, a long time. I'm sure you know they had other things to do other than be thinking about these bones. So it was really Ruth's personal quest and curiosity um, that led her to keep asking all these questions. Um, I also show kids, we talk about, you know, it's not just, I was lucky in that I got to meet people who knew, had known Ruth, I got to be on her land, but sometimes nonfiction writers don't have that opportunity. I'm, I'm working on a book right now that I would love to publish that's from the, it's about someone in the 1880s. So there's no one alive who knew her, um, but of course you are always able to find, whether it's census records, I talked to the South Dakota Historical Society, they helped me out. Uh, I talked to some uh, local newspapers and got obituaries. Um, Rick was able to share with me an article from you know, a publication no longer in existence that I'm sure I would never have found. And I took all these notes and I just collected all this information. Um, and where I'm going now, again, in my kid presentation, I would read you the book and we would go back in time, but I think we're gonna keep going here. Um, uh, and, and then I asked the kids after I read this book, so you know, I, I went to South Dakota, I collected all these notes and I just wrote it, right? I put it in the mail. And I think it's so fun that kids think that it's, it's, it's so easy to write a book. And I have to say, I look back now and I feel so lucky this book Four years is actually not that long of a time. And that's from start to uh, bookstore or in library. Um, so it was really only two years that I spent researching and writing. It can take 10 years, you know, I, we were, um, I was listening, Linda Marshall is a great nonfiction writer who was in this room yesterday and she was talking about things that, you know, you, she started 10 plus years ago and some of them have been published and some of them she's still hoping to find a home for. Um, many, many drafts. I bet 25 is really uh, probably even low and hundreds and hundreds of changes. Um, and one thing I like to show the kids, and I think actually this is interesting for everybody, is how the how art changes in books. And if you were at the last presentation, they were, they were so lucky to have an illustrator here. I am certainly not an illustrator and this incredibly talented woman named Alexandra Bai um, illustrated my book. Um, I can tell you, um, we actually have never met. Um, in fact, I've never even spoken on the phone with her, but we did one um, online presentation when the book came out. Um, and, uh, and she is just a super talented person. She, if you guys have read the Dr. Fauci a nonfiction book that came out right around then, she's the illustrator for that. So she's a real rising star and I feel very lucky that I got to be matched with her. Um, but let me show you some of the stuff about her art and how it changed. So this is the first illustration in the book, her first sketch of the first illustration, which became that, which is so fun to see, I think. Wow. Different. Sometimes the kids say they prefer, whoops, that they prefer this one. <laughs> um, 
And then this is a really interesting thing too that I've, yeah, I hadn't, I just stumbled on the other day. Um, these are what they call thumbnail sketches. Felicia was talking about this in the last presentation, but sometimes those sketches never make it into the book. Um, and this is a great example of one that just didn't make it. It's her saying, I think, I guess, goodbye to her father and then waiting for things in the mail. Maybe it's waiting for the mailman. I don't even know exactly what she's imagining here, but um, uh, just things that never made it and then things that did. That is one of my, my favorite illustrations in the whole book right there, where there's a dinosaur in the stars. Um, let me show one more here. And then I even talk about, for the kids, the, how the words change, because there's so much about revision that I think kids and all of us, right, we don't want to change our writing. <laughs> we don't want to keep rewriting. I think um, if some of you have probably been to the Kate DiCamillo um, pieces this weekend, and it's been so interesting to talk about or how to hear how she retypes the books. I thought that was really interesting um, and how that retyping the whole thing is a way for her to um, improve and move the story forward. So this, I went back um, last week and I went back to my original version of um, like the first draft, the oldest draft that I have. And it was before the Buffalo Rome, the dinosaurs played and ate and roared until sleep became forever. Ruth Mason was the one who woke them up, which I don't think is terrible. But I had an editor, uh, I, an editor who told me, well, then it makes sleep seem kind of scary for the kids. <laughs> and we don't want to scare the kids about sleeping, particularly if you might be reading a book at bedtime. So I was told to take the sleep out at the beginning of the book. Um, but that was, you know, from some some sentences, it's funny, you might, there's some sentences in the book that never changed from the first time I wrote them, but that's a minority of the sentences. And, and I have an amazing agent who really helps me, uh, what we call line edit. So line by line, really crafting and winnowing down where stories need to go, which of course is part of the story behind the story because I think when you read a great children's book, um, I certainly feel this when I read the ones, all the award-winning ones, it almost feels as if this is exactly how it should have been written. You can't imagine the sentences being crafted any other way. And I hope to one day feel, you know, I'm, I'm still working toward that every day, working toward that kind of lyricism and, um, just kind of sense of perfect rhythm in your writing. Um, I tell the kids how much I learn. So this is my first book. I think some of you um, are probably all you are aware of that. I am working on many other things right now. And that's one of the first things I've learned that I was so lucky that this book came out and came out fairly quickly um, and with a major publisher, which is just a thrill to me. It's all over the country. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I was telling the librarian here, I signed it at my own, my neighborhood library where I grew up outside of Washington, DC. And it's just been so great. I've run into parents who've said, my daughter refused to go to school today until we read your book one more time. And I mean, how gratifying that is. And and, and how gratifying it is to be able to stand in front of students and share um, a couple of the messages, the two big messages that I have for them is one, whatever it is that you wanna do, don't give up, right? Be persistent. And I say, never give up. What if Ruth hadn't collected those bones and Rick Brooks had knocked on her door and there was nothing for him to see? Even if people turned her away and turned her down and never answered her questions, um, she kept collecting and believing in herself. Um, and then the other thing I often say to people is like, don't give up because what if you could discover something too? I think there's an amazing message in this story about um, aging. And that's something I actually want to write a, a magazine article about. And there's several nonfiction books, not several, there's probably a bunch about this idea that, you know, your, your pinnacle in life may not be when you're 30 or 40 or 50. I mean, for Ruth, she had to wait until her 80s and she was on that land. So after Rick came, she got to see the dinosaur bones be pulled out of the ground and she baked for the fossil hunters and she stood there. There's a picture in the book as they're, as they're driving by, she really was standing at her house, a house that I got to go see that is still standing outside of faith. And she got that pleasure in life. And um, one of the pictures I love to show at the very end, 
I'm gonna skip ahead. This is again something I do with kids, is this picture of her. And that is the first dinosaur skeleton they ever put together, or mounted is the word, um, from her, the bone bed, which is another great word, the bone bed on her land. And um, that's the first skeleton they put together, and it is in Northern Ireland today in a museum. And it's the only di intact full dinosaur skeleton that they have in that whole area. And how amazing that it came from South Dakota all the way there. And it's all because of Ruth. If she hadn't been so persistent and convinced that something was important, um, it wouldn't have happened. Um, and the book, if you, you've probably already figured this out, but it, it, I, I wanted to call it this because in Wales, where there's another skeleton from South Dakota, from her land, when that skeleton arrived, often so the people who, the fossil hunters who dig it up, they brought it all the way to Wales and the museum there said, well, do you have a name for it? And they said, oh, we call it, we call it Ruth. Um, and I love this idea that, you know, again, that her name and her story kind of lives on, and even in that case, maybe it's just the, the paleontologist at that museum, um, but it lives on, and I hope like for kids who read this book that that idea lives on for them. Maybe they could be paleontologists or maybe it could be whatever they want to do. Um, and it's a message, frankly, I have to embrace too as I go on my own journey as a children's book author, which is no easy journey. And I um, work hard toward publishing another book um, that, you know, you have to be persistent and you have to be like Ruth Mason um, and never give up. So thank you very much for coming. I would love to answer some questions. And I can even pull the book up on the screen if you want to look at some things on the screen. Would you guys like to see it? Um, you would? Okay. It's right here. Um, let me pull it up. We'll do that. Let's see. Where is she from? She is from Faith um, in Zeebok County. Um, so it's like an hour and a half, I think, north of here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll show you. There we are. There are hidden dinosaurs on the, some of the pages. That's one. You can see right there in the clouds. Alexandra, who worked, she spent six months working on the illustrations. And she told me she spent a little longer than normal because she just really felt passionately. She's, she's illustrated a lot of um, nonfiction books, biographies on women. Um, she's like three or four. Um, and so I think she just really connected with Ruth and wanted to you know, illustrate this empowering story. Um, and another one, I, oh, there's another dinosaur. There he is. Um, and I wanna show you Rick, which is always fun to see with the kids. I mean, the kind of things you have to do when you're a nonfiction author is we talked about the color of the bones the shape of the bones. We had multiple paleontologists um, both reviewing this, the wording um, as well as even just the cover. And you can see here this dinosaur has a crest. And this was, oh yeah, let me flip the light for a second. Yep. See this dinosaur has a crest on his head. And when I first saw this or the final version of it, I panicked because I thought, <laughs> Do all, these are all Edmontosaurus annectans, so they're duck-billed dinosaurs. And you can see, this is what I bought on the internet. And this one does have a crest, but as with all things in paleontology, sometimes it is difficult to answer whether the specific dinosaurs on her land had crests. However, in the last few years, there have been what they call skin impressions that have implied there may have been crests. So when they finally showed me this, and then I talked to the paleontologist, they were like, you know, it's possible. It's totally possible. So therefore, this charming dinosaur <laughs> does have a crest, and it went to print without me being concerned uh, that it wasn't, it wasn't accurate. Um, and one thing I didn't say that I'm, oh wait, let me go through the book and then I would tell you guys one more thing. Look, more bones, more shapes of bones. Um, that's, I, that's my favorite, the stars. Um, and then this is a fun picture because of course I was with Rick Brooks last week and all the kids were like, well, he doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> And Rick's like, my hair is not red anymore. I just look a little different. Um, so I mean, this is so great. And this picture itself, he had a picture, a photograph of him and Ruth, and this is how nonfiction works, that I was able to send that photograph to Alexandra. 
and some of the actual art in this is the same art that's in her that was in her house when she lived there so it's like that we're going down to that level of detail um, and it's a really fun just that you're trying you're trying so hard to do that um, so what I wanted to do also before we get to questions I want to give a pitch just keep giving you a pitch for nonfiction. Do we have any teachers or librarians here? Okay, okay. So I am speaking to the South Dakota Library Association on Thursday, and uh, my, my, the title of that presentation is, Is It Time for a Library Revolution? And I think it is, not just because I wrote this one book, which is under M, and if you never look at, I mean, no one's ever gonna find my book, right? Unless you're somehow looking under M in the biogra biographical section. But it's, it's more than just me. It's all the incredible stuff by Melissa Stewart, and I was just mentioning Linda Marshall, and Kate Messner and Carol Boston Weatherford and I think they're these books that I'm just convinced that kids want to read nonfiction because I have three kids and when I bring my to my kids they read it but I think the problem is that sometimes we're not making it easy enough for them to find um, and so I would just want to implore all the teachers and librarians out there that there is I you know what I've been telling people there's magic in the nonfiction section because it, there's stuff for my 10 year old loves to dip into books he's like a total he's what they call a browsable nonfiction kid he he, he, he absorbs trivia. And so he's that kid who's great at flipping through things. My older one is probably more of a narrative nonfiction and there's so many different kinds. Um, but if we don't face it outward, mix the new fiction with the new nonfiction, get it closer to the circulation desk, maybe even organize it by popular nonfiction. I'm just worried, We're, the kids are missing a moment. There's a moment right now in, in nonfiction where, I mean, within the industry, people talk about it being the golden age of nonfiction. And I don't know, that sounds great. I mean, maybe it is, but I certainly know there are books um, addressing what we call historical silences. And um, the book right before mine that they presented was about Japanese internment. That's an important book. We need to be just talking about that. I mentioned Carol um, Boston Weatherford, you know, she's writing about um, the, Tulsa, the Tulsa race massacre. I mean, there's important things that are really presented in a child-friendly way and also beautifully illustrated. Um, and for those emerging readers, there's, there's books out there that are just like great pictures and that might encourage them to read. So that is my pitch for nonfiction. I just, I want to get it in more kids' hands um, and, and I hope you enjoy this. And what, what questions can I answer? Somebody, you've been taking notes, you must have a question. <laughs> Are you a writer? Yes, and I'm just getting to the point where I, I'm gonna be able to jump both feet into it and going crazy on where to start. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited because, uh, you know, it's vacillating between different things and I think it kind of helps cement which project oh, good. I go on first. Oh, good. And ironically enough, it does pertain with I think part of the reason I was able to publish this, I will admit, kids love dinosaurs, right? Teachers love dinosaurs, parents. And I love that this is a book. It is in schools and libraries, but I, I know a lot of people have just bought it for their home library too. It's a fun one just to have at home, um, you know, that, and read it before bedtime or read it with your kids. And the illustrations, thank you, Alexandra, are so appealing, I think, to kids. Yeah, I have five grandsons between the age of three and five. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's high priority. You, you need more bookmarks is what you need. <laughs> um, and there's so many great, I mean, I know you all know about Sue the T-Rex, and of course I'm assuming you know the book on Sue Hendrickson, a similar kind of book. Um, and I think those are very appealing to kids, right? I often say to kids, don't you wanna find treasure in your backyard? And they do. And in this case, it just happened to be dinosaur bone, so. I was wondering if one had been written Sue is a, I think that came out about a year or so before mine. In fact, I kind of panicked. I was like, oh, they're going to talk all about Ruth. The book has nothing to do with that. But Sue has everything to do with Ruth. So the people working on Ruth's land, including Sue Hendrickson, were, were the people who discovered Sue the T-Rex. So had Ruth not collected these bones, not been discovered by Rick Brooks, not found bones as a seven-year-old, Sue the T-Rex maybe might never have been found or found later, you know. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? I, no? What about you guys? You guys have questions. No, you have no questions? Have you ever visited the um, Dinosaur Museum in Hill City? 
No. So I need to go there. And that's the Black, um, the Black uh, Hill Institute. Wait. I've got it right. Yes. Black kills it. Yeah. Yes. And, and they are the folks who dug a lot of these bones. Right. And of course, they're there. And I did talk to them many times, Pete Larson, and they were helpful to me. And in fact, I almost forgot, I have my fossil that I got from them. Um, this is a replica, but it's of a replica of an Montasaurus fossil found on Roos land, which is so special, I think. Because um, again, I don't know that she was necessarily finding something quite this intact, um, but just the fact that that this is eventually what they were able to dig up just proves how right she was the whole time. Um, they, I think if you've read the back of the book, there were 99, or that's actually in the story, that there were 99 dinosaurs, at least 99 dinosaurs, in this bone bed, and just in case you want to know, um, this kind of dinosaur, uh, they call them, they called them the cattle of the Cretaceous. So they were known for moving in large herds. Um, and so probably there was a flood that maybe wiped all these out at the same time. Of course, we cannot know. Um, but that's maybe why there's so many of this one kind of dinosaur in one area. And then there are other kinds of bones suggesting, you know, T-Rexes and other kinds of dinosaurs were coming along and probably feeding uh, what was there. Um, but just even getting across to kids that there was an, a, a sea in this area is you know, so expanding to them. And frankly, expanding to me, I learn, back to my nonfiction, my nonfiction pitch, I learned so much from nonfiction. I learned so much from researching this book. So I haven't been in that area in a long time, but between the the two ladies, is there any way or avenues that people ever can tour it, go out there? That's a great question. I know Ruth's family for a period, um, the Children's Museum of Indianapolis was going out there for many summers and they had just stopped the, the summer I went out, which I, I think they had decided to do digs in other areas. Uh, I don't know what the latest is. That's a great question. I mean, I bet they'd be open to you contacting them and asking them. I mean, I think they've, they've had people do, professionals do digs there, and I just don't know what the latest is. Well, I, I think it was kind of like that, but I, was, um, I had just recently became aware of one by, around Thermopolis, Wyoming. Okay, yep, 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 that, I know that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just north of Kimmerer. Yeah. Which is oh. south of Thermopolis. Yep, so it's yep. actually a site where you can sign up and go dig. And that's, there are a lot of opportunities like that. And you can take kids, which is of a certain age. And I think that's really exciting for the, yeah. that kind of kid who's interested. Um, and yeah, if you're working on a dinosaur book, I would highly recommend you do something like that because it would give you a better sense of what she might have gone through. And also how hard it is for, if you're a private landowner, you can't get Sue the T-Rex out of your cliff. I mean, while you do, they have to, people end up collaborating with other folks, so. Are there any future writers here? Do you guys want to write some books? No, maybe. Because I also talk to kids about how I have, I think everyone should assume you're a writer. I, I just really believe that. And with my little kids, what I used to do is just fold over paper and even have them write and illustrate little books for me. Um, and I think there's no reason kids can't be doing that. Even at the simplest ideas, um, we can all be authors. Um, we cannot all be Kate DiCamillo, <laughs> but we can all be authors. And I'm sure everybody has an important story to tell. Well, I feel like, and no more questions? No, no, I no. Have a okay. So, in the writing process, uh, can you explain a little bit about that kind of tug of war you have with your own ideas and you being the author with then editing? Because you're going to have editors, you're going to have other, a lot of other. <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, the first person you're really at war with is yourself <laughs> because you've done so much research. And um, I mean, some of the stuff that I've worked most recently on, I have binders of newspaper articles like this deep. And I think you have to think about who is the audience um, and you know, it, what is the age of that audience? Who are you writing for? 
And what do they really need to know? What really moves the story forward? Um, I increasingly think about children's books like theater, that a really good children's book, and I, there's, I can't remember who said this, but it's like, it's like raising the curtain on the stage for 30, 30 or 16, they call them spreads. So it's like 16 spreads. And you have to think about um, how much can you put in there without slowing down the story and also leaving room for the illustrator, which uh, last year there was a woman named Laura Gale, who's another great children's book author. And she was here last year. And she did a whole presentation on this. And I'm trying to get better at this. You actually don't want to say everything because you want to leave room for the imagination of the illustrator. Um, and that's maybe sometimes more in fiction, but still in nonfiction, you need to have, I didn't have any idea. I had no idea what the book would look like. So she had to really run with that. But I was able, so where I did give a lot of feedback was more in the illustration, saying things like, colors of the bones aren't right. You know, you, there were words on the, let, on the letters that said something like, Can you, oh, dear Rick. And I was like, I don't think she was writing Rick. She was writing the university. That kind of like tiny correction. Um, but it's, it's a real struggle. And it's really, <clears throat> with children's books, I also think they, there's some, you, know, you really think about your word limit and you need to think about, and I, because I still have kids that are young enough, really think about the readability of it. Um, I, most picture books are typically, a, a nonfiction is typically not more than like 800, 850 words. That is not a lot of words. And then a fiction picture book is more of like three to 500. So some of that is like, it, it helps. I'm often looking at the word count, but it's just, it's a huge struggle. Um, and yeah, you do have to dig in sometimes, um, but um, you also have to be flexible because when you sell that story to a publisher, you sold that story. And so you have to work, partner with them to make it come to life. That's a great question. I feel like I've talked a lot, <laughs> which I'm good at. I understand. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. I am signing books. If anybody wants me to sign a book at 4.30 at the, the lodge, I guess. Yep. And um, yeah. And oh, wait. If any of you are the ones who are teachers or librarians, I have a teacher's guide, um, which is on my website. It's totally free. It it's, it's, uh, has printables. It's, it's standards aligned. And uh, it is, do you want to take a look at it? And um, it is uh, like discussion questions and writing prompts and games and printables. And um, that's another thing I think about nonfiction. We can like bring it right into the classroom and connect it to social studies and connect it to current events whether it's Women's History Month or ge geology is a big one where I've talked to kids um, on World Read Aloud Day, um, which is a fun way to connect um, with classes all over the country. If you guys. Is there, is there an uh, age group that it tends to target? Um, no. The, I mean, that, the book itself is probably geared to like, I think Simon & Schuster says like four to eight. I think it's more like five to eight, four to five. I mean, I've, I presented to preschoolers. And preschoolers love dinosaurs. So there's some games in there you could do with really young kids, but there's writing prompts you could do with older kids. Um, and a lot of nonfiction authors have um, those on their website. They're free. And then, oh, we didn't, one more thing we didn't talk about. My favorite thing, back matter, which um, is the thing in the back of the book. So when my parents, who are in their 80s, uh, give this book to their friends, they're like, start with the back matter. And it's the letter or the questions or the timeline or the photographs. Mine is very straightforward, um, but some of them are just amazing um, with all sorts of extra data. Yeah, any nonfiction book has back matter. And I've heard that sometimes when you're trying to sell it to a publisher, the editor is considering your book, read the back matter first because they want to see how much you truly know. Um, and this is often, I mean, you always know more than what's in the book, which again, gets back to your question, the difficulty of what do you keep in there? So, yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>